Hi, I'm Siggy Vohr, and I'm faculty at Vector Institute, and I'm with David Rokeby, artist in residence at the Jackman Institute at U of T. And David just gave a wonderful talk as part of our series on creativity and AI, and we're going to chat a little bit. Um, one of the things that struck me, many things struck me about during the talk, but was that I saw images that that you that I was already familiar with, and I saw them in a new light, just by the the way you structured the presentation, um, and the way you talked about them, um, and what led up to them. That also made me think that there's a difference between so when we use AI in an artistic process, there's snapshots that it can give us, but there's a lot of what feels to me like intensely human elements to the creation of the structure within which it all happens. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that, does that resonate at all for you, the difference between sort of the, the structure and the, and, the, and, the, and the local things? Context. Yeah. Context matters. Um, I'm just curious, is there a particular example of, a, of an image that, so I can... Um, the activation, like all of this, it was a lot of the stuff during the exposition about neural networks. Okay. So the the photos of the activations of neurons. Right. Um, and some of the deep dream images, including right. the, the video of the deep dream right. image. Right. Um, so things that I had seen in papers. Right. But they were placed in a very different context. Right. Okay. So. Uh, I think there are two interesting things about about contextualizing these images, um, and it's an interesting challenge for me even because I have looked at so many of those images and I find them deeply intriguing, and I don't really know what to think of them in in isolation. It's actually you mean just okay. So there's an image, and that image is kind of weird, and it's kind of beautiful, and it's kind of ugly. And it's really detailed, and it's a lot of things that are very stimulating. And I want to keep looking at them, and yet I don't know how to give them value. And that's an interesting thing. Understanding those images directly in the context of what they come from, and the unbelievably immense pool of near and far images that the latent space of those systems contains, for me, is one of the things that makes them interesting. And as an artist, I'm always trying to understand why something catches my attention or holds my interest and make some sense out of it because, and I'm still having, I'm still trying, I'm still struggling, struggling with those images. I think it's very interesting, for example, with deep dream images, a lot of the really hardcore uh, machine learning artists I, I converse with come back to this thing about deep dream, like that they, they can't, still can't get over deep dream, even though GANs are amazing, for example, generative adversarial networks are doing amazing things, there's something about deep dream that just, and the, the connection to the visual system and the visual system hallucinating and its relationship to our way of looking, all these things give these images, which are both fascinating and strangely banal, new life. Yes, I think so. I hope so. And I'm very happy to hear that you got that from because I was nervous, I was so nervous. In fact, I was talking to our mutual friend Xavier Xavier right. the other day about it. I said, I'm going to show some deep dream images. He said, oh, really? <laughs> he was concerned about the fact that I was going to do that. But I thought, no, I think it's important to, to understand this thing that interests me about images and the relationship to the space and the relationship to the vision. And I guess the deep dream images aren't attempting, their goal isn't realism. Right. Whereas with GANs, sort of within the research context, sometimes one of the goals is realism. Right. And something you mentioned that I've felt in music as well is it's very interesting to to break the systems and see where they crack. Mm -hmm. um, if if I want total realism, I can go outside. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's other contexts where one may you know photo editing where one wants it or one doesn't want it, but 
this notion of uh, breaking the tool or the, the flaws. And, and, and even comes before breaking. Um, because, so, so GANs are in a way becoming less interesting when they get better. Right? They're, they're amazing. They're more amazing and less interesting. Right? The degree to which style GAN can now really do the face, big time. It can really do the face. It's a, it's a mixed blessing, right? The, 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 this like the objective has become realism because it's the, it was the hardest, it seemed like the hardest thing, and it's become realism, and it's time to let go of realism, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and Deep Dream, Deep Dream is, is so not much not about realism, it's really about pushing the artifact to the limit, in a sense. It's not quite artifact, but in a sense, showing somehow exposing something about the operations of the system by this feedback that that causes this explosion of stuff out of nothing. It's, that's fascinating, right? That's, that is meaningful in a different way than the realism one can now achieve through amazing research in Kent, and it's amazing research. Yeah, in fact, especially the, when you just said more, more amazing and less interesting, yeah. one of the things that that, that implies is um, when we say that something's amazing it's usually it, it can almost sound objective this is objectively amazing mm -hmm. when we say that something's amazing and less interesting it really reminds us that there's a there's a subjective element that can only be true when there's a person right. involved right. in having these assessments and it's relative to what they, they're wanting um, or interested in that's, you know, when we look at anything or listen to anything or experience anything, we're usually, we have multiple frames that we put around it. We're experiencing it in different ways simultaneously. And we have multiple intentions or objectives when we're doing it. And those things are all active at the same time. So we can find something ex excellent according to one objective and really not according to another and middle and according to another and we're always sort of juggling that. So that, that's kind of an expression of a sort of that way that's, we have of weighing things. I, I, yeah, that's really cool because I, I often find that in creative processes um, there's sometimes a there's an interest in playing with those various objectives simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of an awareness that this will be perceived on a few different layers, mm -hmm. and sometimes you almost you want them to be synchronized, or sometimes you want you want them you almost want a certain tensions. Right. So as an artist, you really want to be hitting people at several different layers at once, and the, when you're communicating different things at different levels at the same time something happens to the person viewing it. That's an experience, a different experience. So being pulled in separate ways at the same time, and you're laughing, and you're crying, and you're smiling, and you're finding something interesting, all at the same time. That's kind of the holy grail, right? To, to actually draw people in multiple dimensions, directions at once. Something that, uh, so a, a few questions came up at the end. Um, mm -hmm. Ownership, mm -hmm. um, authorship uh, are there other the role of artists as and the role of AI as as sort of progress is being made um, are there other questions or um, among those are there some that are particularly important for you right at the moment or some that you feel didn't haven't been asked as much but are, are on your mind a lot or are you not necessarily thinking, focused on any of those questions? Well, I think there is an interesting question that's a really a, 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 almost a pure commercial art world question about value. The example that I brought, uh, brought up of the auction of that one GAN produced artwork um, for half a million dollars is one example of this value question. I, at the same time, I see some of the best artists working in this field selling prints for 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 50 bucks. And partly it's because they don't 
I think, don't understand the potential value of the work, but it's probably because they want it to get out there. They want people to see it, right? And it's, that's part of the sharing, I think, that's part, it's been such an important part of the whole machine learning world, is also the sharing of code, the sharing of, of research as quickly as possible. That's, that's, that's a remarkable thing about it. The desire to share the output is there as well. But outside of the, and, and then there's a challenge when I create something with machine learning where I know I'm using, if not a completely trained system, at least a, a system that someone has engineered and then I've just done some transfer learning with another data set or something, you know, I'm aware that so much of what I'm producing is the fruit of someone else's labor. And I know also that, some, that, that often these networks have such identifiable looks that if I, try, if I sold this, if I found someone to buy for $10,000 a print of this particular image, that I will be trading in a lot of other people's work, and my contribution will be relatively minor. And people, and someone will go, well, oh, okay, well, that was done with you know, Wasserstein again, and whatever. You know, and, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a really awkward position uh, in terms of, because, because some people make a living from their job, some people teach. Some artists make a living by selling their work or exhibiting it, and the perceived value of that work becomes important. Yes. And, and this, in interesting but challenging way, problematizes that question. Right? And so the question of who is the owner, who is the author, uh, yeah. who is the creator? Is it the machine? Is it the, the designers of the network? Is it the artist who made the network do that particular one? Is it the person who chose that image? Yeah. It's a big, it's a big question, and, but it's, it's an honest question, right? It's a real question. There are real issues at stake about the value of research, the creative impact of research, the creative impact of choosing, you know, like these are important. The things. value of the data set. The value of the data set, right, is, a, is a, uh, um, an easy thing to sweep under the carpet unless you're okay. the person putting the data set together with yes. you know, like, like many, many, many person hours of, of time. Um, Are there particular things that you are, at the intersection of AI and art, that you're exci particularly excited about right now? Or excited to see what happens with? It's, yeah, it's a, it's, um, that's a hard question. Partly because I find myself in a challenging position myself as an artist in relationship to machine learning. Um, part of my quandary is for most of the past 40 years that I've been working creatively with computers, I have been like right in the, right in the deep code building my own computers, writing computer languages, and working from there up. And stepping, even though I played with, art, with you know, networks and things like that in the 90s, stepping back in now is quite an experience. Because <laughs> I can't really be the person I was in relationship to, the technolo to this technology that I was to the technologies of the 80s and 90s. There's no way, I just can't, I don't even have the time of the day to keep up if I have the brain cells. You know, I feel, I've been feeling really stupid recently. So it's hard for me to, I'm trying to decide where to position myself, and so what I find interesting depends on that. If I am, if, if I'm going to hack away at, at, at PyTorch for the next year, that's one level, and there will be things I'm interested in. There's lots of things that come up in my Twitter feed yeah. that's half politics and half uh, machine learning yeah. uh, that, that is like, this seems really exciting. But then is it on the artistic level of what people are doing with it? Is it on a more social level of how the technology is existing out there in the world? These are, it's, it's so hard for me to pick. There's so much, it's overwhelming. There is a lot, and the speed I find is overwhelming. And that, it's not happening in a vacuum. And it's happening within a, a sort of a bigger social sphere. And when, when things move at that speed, um, it's a little, it's a, as I joked uh, with Richard when he yeah. asked his question after the talk, 
um, I'm hoping that the veteran student can slow down the pace of, uh, of, of development and machine learning for a bit so we can all catch up and sort of assess it and measure it properly because it's, it is, and it is clearly feeding back on itself, the rate at which papers are published, consumed, um, code, replicant code being produced and then advanced on, it's, so, so and my concern is and this happened, this happened in a similar way in the 90s. Um, with the first uh, real um, arrival of VR, uh, a lot of the art institutes that invested in VR were spending m most of their, their, their money just upgrading their systems to keeping up, and the technicians and artists working with them were just keeping up with changing software. So very little work actually got made. And at the time, I developed a, a model, the leapfrog model, <laughs> for myself, where I, because I, I want to master a technology, and then I know that I'm going to be wait. Once I've mastered one stage or one part of that technology, I know I'm going to have to jump, but I'm going to master it and then jump, go to the next really promising thing, that's a leap I can make, and then hunker down there, master that, and jump. Because it's hard to make, to really make art with a tool that's constantly in flux. Because you don't even know what the tool is expressing with you. Because you're, you're, you're trying to do something, but the tool, whatever that is, the paintbrush or the, the neural network, is guiding your creation at the same time. And you don't really know what's happening until you've sat with it for a while. So I think, think I'm going to be leapfrogging, and I'm not ready to jump yet. That's the most honest answer to the question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.